Hello, and thank you for joining us here on The Neutral Zone. I am Phil Milani, joined as always by my trusty sidekick, my partner in crime, really. The best way to describe this person is my everything. It's at Eric Dalala. Hey, Phil. Can you hear me What's okay? What's going on? Yeah, of course I can. Oh, okay, good. There was just a little bit of a delay there. I'm not sure. Um, I like to let you... it sink in a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say, how are you feeling on this Monday? Um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of over it, over the game. Like you just got to move past one like that. Sort of a strange feeling because you're not really upset about necessarily the way they played or you don't, you know, you can't really break down like, oh, if this play would have changed this play. It's the whole feel of the game and what happened. You're just sort of a meh. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to, to put it. Um, well, nonetheless, we still have a great show in store for everybody. Uh, we'll hear from Vic Fangio, what he had to say the day after the Broncos' 31-3 to loss to the Saints. Eric, uh, we can uh, dive in, talk about Drew Locke a little bit. It wouldn't be an episode of the Neutral Zone without some Drew Locke talk. No, it really wouldn't be. But uh, on the flip side, we do have some positive uh, news, some positive stuff to talk about with Garrett Bowles. Signed a four-year extension to stay in Denver. We'll have a one-on-one -on -one with him. Had a chance to uh, catch up with Bowles on Monday. Uh, pretty good interview, I thought. Uh, he had a lot of good things to say that I think uh, everybody will enjoy. And then, Eric, as we like to do on Mondays, we've got some uh, voicemails and emails to read. Thank goodness. I love that. You know, the game made might have been meh, but NZ Nation <laughs> is definitely energized, I think. As always, as always. Uh, if you would like to be a part of the show, you could call in 707-NEUTRAL. You can leave a voicemail and we'll play it right here on the air. Uh, Eric, they could also write a voice, uh, write an email. I always mess That's that right. up. I can't, That's I okay. can't really, yeah, I have a hard time saying that. It's a neutral zone show at gmail.com. Neutral zone at gmail.com. And uh, you could also hit us up on Twitter at Eric Delala with an A, at Phil Milani with a PH. That's the best way to get in touch with us. Or you could also leave a comment on YouTube. We read all of them. Uh, Eric often uh, cries after he reads them. I'm not That's happy. True. I, don't, I don't like how mean they are to you. I really don't. <laughs> Nicely played. Well done. You might want to listen to the voicemails we have coming up because they tend to disagree yeah. with you, Eric. <laughs> I heard you called your friends and appeal to them to call in for once. It's nice of you, of them to oblige. It is. It is. And with that, let's dive into uh, the game here, Eric. Of course, uh, Kendall Hinton uh, playing quarterback for the Broncos. Although, did Philip Lindsay technically get the start at quarterback? Is that what you um not sure if he got the start at quarterback, but he did he get took a the start. first snap. He took the first yes, snap. Yes, he did. Which is a very interesting there. But um, you know, the whole fiasco with uh, the quarterback situation, them getting pulled out of practice on Saturday, uh really about 24 hours for Hinton to uh get ready to play this game. Uh some talk about trying to get Rob Calabrese into the into the roster and get him to play. He's an assistant co offensive coach, played a little bit of quarterback in college. They thought maybe they could get him in there. Just a sort of a bizarre Saturday uh, for the Broncos, especially considering they did not practice on Friday. Uh, Thursday was Thanksgiving. Just a really strange week, Eric. Yeah, it was. And, you know, I'm not sure you could have expected much more than what you got during the game. One for nine, 13 yards. Uh, two interceptions. I'm glad he was able to complete a pass. You know, there's only been one team since the merger that has not completed a pass in a game. So I'm glad the Broncos did not uh, join that group. Glad they did not get shut out and ruin a home uh, streak of not being shut out that's spanned decades. So those are a couple of positives, I guess, but you know, I'm not going to uh, put too much stock in how Kendall Hinton did or did not play because he he just was put in an impossible situation um, and, and credit to him for even going out there and uh, doing the work ahead of time to try to get ready. We saw him on the field before the game and he's handing off to Philip Lindsay and Melvin Gordon. And it's probably the first time he's 
handed a ball off to anybody in three years since he had a start at Wake Forest. So, uh, and then, you know, that's not even mentioning that a couple months ago, he wasn't even on the practice squad, Phil. He was back, uh, I think he said, selling fundraisers and kind of figuring out what was going to come next for him. And the NFL dream was almost dead. And instead, he gets a not a start at quarterback, but to play some significant time there. So, uh, you know, uh, if we look back at this five years from now, I'm not sure if anyone's going to remember exactly what his stat line is. You'll just remember, hey, Kendall Hinton uh, kind of took over in an, in an impossible situation uh, and, you know, that'll be my lasting impression. A lot of courage from Hinton. I'll say that. I was nervous when I woke up on Sunday morning for Hinton. Uh, you know, and when I saw him run out onto the field, I was like, gosh, uh, that guy really answered the bell because he just gets a phone call and says, you're going to play quarterback now in an NFL game. I mean, uh, I don't know about you, Eric, but I was getting a lot of joke texts, a lot of uh, comments on Twitter about, hey, Phil, are you ready to play quarterback? That's like not as crazy. I mean, like uh, it, it kind of had gotten to that point for the Broncos where they were like, what are our options here when they, you know, were considering what to do at quarterback? And, you know, for Hinton, that that was really stepping up for your team. That was uh, saying, hey, I'm going to go out there and do whatever I can to help. But uh, yes, that was an impossible situation. I think that anybody who watches an NFL game moving forward is going to be able to say, look at how difficult this position is to play because this guy played at, at a Division I college. And, and that's what happened, you know? So, I mean, it had been a while since he played quarterback, but um, I just thought it was tremendous that he was able to, you know, step up like that and play in a game and it was sort of a perfect storm considering what this Saints defense is all about. They came into the game second in uh, stopping the run. So, I mean, it was almost, uh, you know, you couldn't have asked for, you just couldn't have asked for a, a perfect, more perfect storm to hit the Broncos. Yeah. And, you know, part of the issue too, is that you didn't even have a couple of days of practice to get some read option stuff ready to get a few pass plays. I mean, there was just no time to, even try any of that. So it was essentially what it looked like was basic blocking schemes and, you know, run off the right tackle, run off the left tackle, run up the middle. I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit more complex than that, but probably not much more so just because they didn't have any of that time. Um, and, you know, credit to Kendall, of course, but credit to the offensive line, to those running backs that were saying, hey, we're going to, you know, Philip Lindsay ends up suffering a little bit of a knee injury. But, I mean, those guys were taking the snap and running straight into, you know, a really good Saints defense that knew what was coming. And then a defense for the Broncos that had to keep going out there again and again against what had been a pretty effective Saints offense. It would have been really easy for these guys to just say, you know, we've got no chance. We're not going to try at all. And even though the score got out of hand a little bit, it was tied after one quarter. And really until there were two or three minutes left in the second quarter, it was still a one possession game. Yeah. I, Hinton said, I think he learned about 30 to 40 plays on Saturday night that they were going to try and possibly use, but um, definitely a simplified version of that. But Eric, you just brought up something that I think uh, leads nicely into our second point here. And it's, if you're a Broncos teammate, how do you feel about what took place here on Sunday that you were forced to essentially play a game without a quarterback and, uh, you know, that sort of puts you in an impossible situation. I mean, a lot of credit goes to Kendall Hinton, but also, like you mentioned, like Philip Lindsay had to go out there and he found out what happens when a snap is low, you know, and it gets picked up and taken the other way. Uh, the defense you mentioned, they essentially were asked to go out there and say, hey, if you can, let's get a turnover and try and return that for a touchdown or something, you know. Uh, how would you feel if you were somebody – uh, uh, how would you feel toward guys like Drew Locke, uh, Brett Rippon, because they are the ones who sort of put this team in this position? Well, let me start by saying that I think the defense uh, has a right to be frustrated because they played well enough that I think with a quarterback, the Broncos are in position to win that game. And Sean Payton, the Saints coach, talked a lot after the game about how he changed the game plan a little bit. They, they decided to be a lot more conservative because they knew there was only a certain number of ways they could lose that game. And one of them was turning the ball over. 
but I do think, you know, the Broncos did decently against the run in the first half. Certainly Taysom Hill had very little success passing the ball. Uh, so I think part of the reason you might be frustrated is that you had a chance here to play a good game against an eight and two team coming in. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I think everybody's probably a little bit frustrated to some degree. I certainly would be. Um, you expect, as Vic Fangio said, the QBs to be the leaders of the team of the offense and to uh, maybe just have a little bit more awareness, even if it was, as Drew Locke said in a statement, an honest mistake, one that, uh, you know, they got a little bit lax. But, you know, you're the quarterback of an NFL team. I think the responsibility is higher than it is for a lot of other positions. But Phil, all that said, I, I do think, you know, as Vic Fangio said on Monday, as Kareem Jackson said, as Gary Bowles said Monday, you know, they're going to they're gonna move on. They're going to get past this, and I don't think it's going to linger. Um, it might have been a little different, Phil, if this was wild card weekend and you had a chance to win a playoff game and all of a sudden you lose that shot. I mean, in terms of the grand scheme of the season, it doesn't change a whole lot in terms of the Broncos' record or, or what's ahead of them from that perspective. So maybe that dilutes – the feelings a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I understand that, but I mean, I don't know if players necessarily go into a game thinking that this is a meaningless game. You know, I mean, they put their bodies on the line, they go out there and they're, you know, they're competitive. They want to win every single game. And when you essentially tell them you need to go play, but there's no chance to win this game that puts, puts a lot on, on that's asking a lot of the players there. And uh, you know, they obviously want to put good film out there. They want to play their best, but that's that's not that's not a great feeling. I'll just say that. You mentioned uh, Drew's statement there. Uh, he, as part of it here, I'll just say he says, "I sincerely apologize, and I fully understand why these safety precautions are so important. Doing the right thing for a majority of the time is not good enough." And he then he goes on and says, "I pray for my teammates' health and health, safety, and success today." Uh, he's looking forward to getting back on the field next week, but and you even sort of mentioned it, Eric, I think that your next step is to think about the player's health and safety, because now you're asking Phil Lindsay to go out there and run the ball a lot more than maybe he would normally put him in an uncomfortable position, taking snaps the whole game. Um, and you, you can't help but start thinking about their health. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. And I doubt anyone feels worse about this than Drew and, you know, I think that's fair given that, you know, a lot of it falls on him. I, Vic Fangio mentioned that he needs to do a better job emphasizing the importance of the protocols to everyone on the team. Um, you know, do I think Drew and the quarterbacks are the only position group around the NFL that have had these sort of slips? No, I mean, you saw at the end of Sunday Night Football, Tom Brady's going up to Patrick Mahomes without a mask on, which is expressly against the protocols as well. Um, the Broncos just happened to be, uh, you know, they were punished for it. And I have a hard time. I know a lot of people out there are upset with the NFL. You know, my kind of thought is if you follow the protocol or you're, you don't put yourself in that position, there's nothing they can punish you for. So, you know, maybe you think it's unfair that the Ravens game was moved and the Broncos game wasn't, but um, I think Drew, I think Vic Fangio, uh, I think several other people would all say, hey, we've just got to do a better job adhering to the rules and controlling what you can control. It is a little bit, as a fan, I would think frustrating to just, you know, it's it would be frustrating not understanding what some of these rules are. Why does one game get moved? Why does this game not get moved? Why does this happen? Why, you know, because I would say a lot of the reaction from fans has been the NFL is just against the Broncos. The NFL is uh, just, uh, they would never do this if this was Patrick Mahomes. They wouldn't do this if this was Cam Newton. Um, but because it's the Broncos, they don't care. I mean, what do you say to fans who are, this is clearly the feeling that they have? I mean, they did it to Cam Newton. The Patriots went to uh, Arrowhead and played without Cam Newton. So they, they did yep. it to them. I think they, um, they, they bring that up because they moved the Broncos game when uh, uh well, following that first of all i think the contract tracing protocols and rules are much more defined now than they were at that point in the season um so it's easier you've seen the last few weeks some guys will go on the, the COVID list and you know they'll have to be there they'll miss a game but it's not 
delaying games or putting games in jeopardy the way it had. The only real reason we've seen a game get pushed now, which is what's happening with the Baltimore-Pittsburgh game, is that there's the risk of ongoing transmission. And if that were, you know, if there was a risk of ongoing transmission in Denver, I'm sure the NFL would have moved the game to protect people's safety. But, you know, at least from a COVID standpoint, it seemed like there was no risk once the quarterbacks isolated. And so the game went on and, you know, they've been very clear from the beginning. doesn't matter if it's your backup right guard. doesn't matter if it's your starting quarterback. These are the rules. And so, you know, it, it may seem unfair. It may seem like the Broncos are being targeted, but I really don't. That's not the vibe that I get. Yeah. Uh, I understand the uh, uh, being upset about it, though, because health and safety of the players, uh, the fans feeling like they just had no chance to win that game and um, just an all around terrible situation, I would say, you know, uh, just not a not a great way to uh, play a football game like that. And, you know, the result, you can't be you can't have any real feeling about the result because it was sort of just expected, you know, so. But the Broncos must move on. Uh, let's play what Vic had to say in terms of what's going to happen for uh, the quarterbacks who broke the rules. What's in store for them moving forward here? Yeah, we're going to consider all that, you know, and uh, again, try and, you know, see what the league has, if they have anything planned. And if not, you know, then we'll, we'll take our measures. So Eric, he says that they're going to wait and see what the league has to do and then make a decision on how uh, they want to move forward. But he did say that all discipline options were on the table, although he said they were more likely to uh, just go with a fine versus a, a suspension or something like that. Yeah, I mean, a suspension just puts you back in the same position you just were in and ultimately punishes the rest of the team more than it does the quarterbacks, I think. So uh, whatever they choose, like I said, I'm sure nobody feels worse about it than than Drew Locke. And he's gonna he's taken some heat. He'll probably continue to take some heat here over the next few days when he talks to the media. Um, scheduled to talk on Wednesday like normal. Uh, obviously, if he continues to test negative, he can come back. The best way for Drew Locke to respond, Phil, is just to go out and, and play a great game against Kansas City and somehow lead this team to an upset. Or if he can't do that, you know, just play well over the remaining few games. Show that. He's taking everything seriously, uh, be a leader if he sees other people not taking the protocol seriously. Uh, that's the way to kind of regain the trust if there is any that's been lost. Yeah, and Vic said that, look, his uh, uh, trust in Drew and the rest of the quarterbacks is not shaken right now. He feels uh, that he was disappointed with uh, what happened, but uh, they still believe in Drew. And you heard Garrett Bull say that on Monday that he still loves Drew and that, you know, they're behind him. Uh, as the quarterback of this team, but, you know, uh, he, he's just got to apologize and then move forward. And like you said, just do your job, come back and try and, and be the best quarterback, best leader that you can be, but just add it onto the list for, for what this season has been like for Drew, because you talk about the injury and then the struggles and the t lack of team success this year. And then, you throw on this on top of it. And uh, that pretty much sums up his sophomore campaign. Yeah. That to me is maybe the, the disappointing thing is that because of the injuries, because of the lack of success, uh, both for him and as the team goes that he would just, you know, make sure at every Avenue to um, not give any other reason for criticism or to prevent him from being on the field. You know, uh, to me that just, whether it's fair or not, you have higher expectations of the quarterback position. And so that's where you'd hope that he'd say, hey, we've all got to be wearing these, you know, even if it's uncomfortable, even if we're just taking them off for a few minutes. Uh, you know, that that to me is what you expect from a, from a quarterback, just to – you've got to be available no matter what. And this year there's an added step to make sure you can be out there. And you just hope that uh, he takes this to heart. Yeah, yeah. And all you can do is uh, take it, move on, and uh, try and get ready for Kansas City coming in this week. And the Broncos are going to be playing on Sunday night football in front of the whole country going up uh, against Patrick Mahomes, that Chiefs offense. We saw what Tyreek Hill did uh, yesterday, 200 yards and one quarter of offense. Uh, uh, so it's just amazing what they've been able to do there. So uh, 
this is another opportunity to try and uh, rewrite uh, what the narrative on this season. If you go to Kansas City and able to pull off a win, uh, people will forget about what happened this week. <laughs> I guess uh, that's the best way to put it there. So, Eric, let's uh, move on here. Let's get to uh, talk about Garrett Bowles a little bit. Uh, first, uh, we'll get into his contract and all that and his play a little bit here in just a second. But first, let's hear from Garrett Bowles. I had a chance to uh, catch up with him a little bit on Monday. Garrett, first of all, uh, congratulations on the new deal. How did it feel to put pen to paper? Uh, it felt great, man. Um, I love the city. Um, I love this team. I'm thankful for you know everyone in the front office, um, Mr. Elway, Mr. Ellis, Matt Russell, um, my teammates, um, everyone in the building. I'm you know I, I've gained so many friendships over the years. Um, it's just beyond grateful for me and my family to be here. Um, this is our home, and uh, we, we're looking forward to many more great years. Why why do you feel such an attachment to Denver? Um, one, they drafted me, um, and that's you know that's a huge that's a huge thing. Um, you know, just they trusted me and they could have chosen a lot of other people, but they put their trust in me to come in. And, you know, I've had my I've had my moments, my rocky moments, but them trusting me again to, to be their left tackle for many years to come. And um, it's just a blessing. And I love it here. I serve my mission here. Um, I love the people here. Um, this is where I, I want to make my my home for me and my family. And uh, we're looking like I said, it's a uh, it's a blessing. And uh, I'm really excited for the opportunity. And uh I'm going to take it very seriously, and then hopefully we can get back to where we belong. Garrett, I know that you're a big family man. I remember the day after you were drafted, you had your son at the facility, your wife was there. What does a deal like this do for your whole family? Um, it blesses my family in a lot of ways. Um, takes care of my family for a lot of years, um, which is, you know, that's every husband's goal is to, you know, provide for their family, and I get to do it by playing the game I love, but it also just not only that, but it, it, it blesses my family, but we get to bless people now here in Denver. We get to, you know, um, create a foundation and to and really focus on what's important and, and bless the children that are in need here in Denver. And, you know, that's, I love to serve. I learned serving is an important attribute to me and my family. I learned it on my mission. Um, and I'm looking forward to just continuing to serve the, the people here in, in Denver. Um, this is a great city. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are in need, and I'm looking forward to, to getting out there and, and helping them as as many ways as I can. So you plan on creating a foundation? Absolutely. Um, I, I really want to open up a boys home. That's my goal and, uh, and really focus on the youth here um, and really, you know, be that uh, role model for them um, and just serve them in any way I can. Um, like I said, uh, I, I've been very emotional um, over the last couple hours or at last couple of days of, you know, signing a contract here and, and then putting the trust back into me, but uh, just being, just being excited for the opportunity to come in here and to, to play my position, left tackle position, and, and really focus on the importance of winning and then helping my teammates realize that and, and also helping this community to get back to where we belong. And that's being on top of the AFC West. Uh, I know that your childhood was not always the easiest. You had a lot of ups and downs. After signing a deal like this, do you ever take time to reflect and think back? And like, what would you tell your, your you know, 13 year old self? Oh man, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I really would just tell my 13 year old self to keep fighting. Um, you know, life, life brings all different, you know, curveballs and, and different things along the way. But the one thing you can know is my favorite quote is it doesn't matter how you start it matters, how you finish. Um, and, you know, going through, you know, my last couple of years, which, you know, I'm not pleased with, you know, how I played, you know, I, I always strive to be better. Um, but, uh, you know, this last couple, you know, this year, I, I took it upon myself to really identify what, what I was doing was wrong and really fix it. I feel like I'm playing at a high level now where I belong. And uh, I know the Broncos feel the same way and, and, and them blessing me with that. But just not giving up on yourself. You know, people, people may say things, but that should just be fueled to your fire and continue to go reach your dreams and, and really never give up. It just really focus on what's important. And that's, you know, Faith family football for me and my family. And if I did that, I knew that, you know, football and everything else would take care of itself. And that's what, did, that's what happened. And I'm just very grateful and, and very blessed. You had a lot of critics over the years here, especially here in Denver. How did you use that as motivation? Just to get better. Um, you know, you have, you have multiple things that you can do. You either can let that, those critics bring you down and, and put you in a hole, or you let those critics fuel the fire and continue to get better. And, and prove people that you belong where you belong. And, and that's just the type of person I am. 
you know, my whole life I've had critics. I've had critics. I'll never be here. I'll have critics. You know, you're not smart enough to go to college. You're never going to, you're not going to get married. And, and I can just continue to be like, you know what, I'm going to do it. You know, I, I have a learning disability. So I took that upon myself to, you know, to, to let that fuel me and, and to show people that, you know, like I said, I go back to my quote again, it doesn't matter how you start matters, how you finish, let, let the, let the fire become your, um, your motto and continue to fight for what you believe in and really focus and identify what's important in your life and, and let that drive you. And that's what I did. And, uh, and, you know, I'm just grateful, man. Um, like I said, I'm emotional. Um, I'm very thankful for this opportunity. I, I love Mr. Airway dearly. Um, I love coach Fangio dearly. Um, you know, him, those two putting up with me throughout the years and really, you know, never giving up on me and Mike Munchak coaching me hard and, and, and doing everything they can to provide for me. And, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm thankful for so many people and, uh, I'm grateful I get to be back in the Broncos uniform. Uh, Vic said that you guys had an emotional moment together on Saturday. Uh, what was that like being able to share that with him? Oh man. Uh, I got to go into his office and, uh, give him a big hug. And, uh, you know, he told, he always told me, you know, my, we met over the off season, um, when he became the coach, you know, he was always that person I could rely on and, and trust. And we, you know, we have a very good relationship. You know, it's, it's a very neat relationship and I, I'm very thankful for that. Um, but uh, he told me, you know, you can do it. What I want more for you is to go out there and prove everyone wrong. And, 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 and that's, I, I put that in the back of my head and, and I know that's what he wanted me to do. He, you know, he wanted me to be that left tackle that he can count on and can rely on and, and continue to move the offense forward. And, and so when I did it and, and we had that moment together, it, it was very special and uh, I'm very thankful for him. And, the times that, you know, he, he got hit hard for keeping me in there, but I knew he was, he knew at that time he was doing the right thing. And, and I told him, um, coach, thank you so much for, for blessing me with this opportunity. And I promise you, I'll never let that down. And he's going to hold me accountable for that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I kind of feel like sometimes like your support system can make a huge difference in your life, you know, and uh, having the right coaching staff, the right people around you can just make that switch possible. Uh, has Mike Munchak been that for you, Garrett? Absolutely. Coach Munchak's a phenomenal coach. Um, he's blessed me. He pushes me hard. Um, he makes me a better player and uh, he changed my game. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, you know, he's a Hall of Famer, not only as a player, but he's going to be a Hall of Famer as a coach. Um, our relationship is special. I talk to him weekly. We talk before the game, after the game, throughout the week. Um, and, you know, he always just gives me little pointers here and there from, you know, or stories of him playing or, you know, from him coaching previous people. So, um, he's a very smart man. Um, I'm grateful I get to have him as my coach for the next four years and hopefully in my entire career. And uh, so I'm, I don't take that lightly. I take that very seriously. And, and I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm just happy. I'm happy he has to coach me. I'm happy uh, I get to be here with him and, and we get to grow together. Not just having him, but also having the same coach for back-to-back -back years, that consistency. I know that that's, you know, it's changed every year for you until Munchak got here. How, how important has that been? Oh, huge. I mean, I've gone through O-line coaches like a lot of people drink water. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a, been a lot of changes here. Um, but, uh, you know, those changes is what helps a player grow. You know, if you, you embrace the change, you get to come out on top. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I, you know, I've had my bumps in my roads. I've had moments where I wasn't playing at a high level. But those moments uh, uh, made me who I am today. Um, I look back on all those years, and, and I'm grateful for those moments because I uh, – it helped me learn, it helped me grow, and it helped me not only as a player, but as a husband. And uh, now having Coach Munchak here for my second year in a row and for the next four years, and hopefully, you know, we retire you know, together. I mean, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want. I want him to be my coach for a very long time because of our friendship and the love that we have for one another. And uh, like I said, he's, he's just a phenomenal man um, and a phenomenal coach. And, and uh, you know, when he played, he was a phenomenal player as well. So. He brings so much to the table that a lot of people don't get to see. Uh, and I get to see that every single day working with him. And it, it's a blessing. Uh, just a couple more for you here, Garrett. I know, I know so many people have talked about the sudden turn in your level of play. Did, did you ever feel like there was a moment where you're like, I'm getting this, like this is working now. I, I feel different out on the field. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think when you start playing, you start to really realize, okay, the game's going to start to slow down for you at some point. I mean, you, my last three years, I've seen so much stuff thrown at me. Blitzes, going against the best pass rushers, you know, day in and day out. You know, we have two of our own 
Von Miller and Bradley Chubb that I get to go against every day and learn from them. But as you, as my motto is to be the best left tackle to ever play the game. And, and I truly believe I can, I can be that. And when you want to be like that, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a long period of time and doing the same thing over and over again. And then when I go back and I, and I reflected this off season of, of what I needed to do to become better, I didn't change anything. I just reflected on what, what was, what was going on and how can I eliminate those mistakes? And when I did that, it really was an eye opening of how I really can change and be the football player that the Broncos want me to be in for many years to come. And, and that's what I showed this year. I, I really showed that, you know, I grown as a man, I grown as a father and a husband to my beautiful family that I have. But not only that, I, 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 I believed in myself and I really focused on what was important and that's what I'm showing. And, and I know if I do that, I'm going to be at the high level and, and be the best tackle to play the game. No one ever doubted your athleticism. I know that you're one of the top athletes at your position, but maybe you didn't have quite the experience coming into the NFL. Did you feel like you just needed those reps to work through this? Like you mentioned, uh, get through some time here and then you knew it was just a matter of time. Absolutely. I mean, everyone needs reps. When I first came to the league, I didn't play left tackle that long as much as, you know, an average guy that come or most tackles that come in the league play five years in college. I played two years at a junior college and one year at Utah and I came here. So repetition is, is my key to success. And, you know, the more I rep at it, the more I take my sets, the more I feel, you know, the weight in between my toes, the more I, you know, see my hand placement, the more I watch film and see the players and see previous players, you know, that, you know, Hall of Famers, Joe Staley, Joe Thomas, Jonathan Ogden. Um, I watch those guys and I, and I see how they play, you know, Jackie Slater, all those guys that are very successful at the position, you know, at the tackle position. I watch what they did and, and I watch how, you know, they became the best and, and I tried to, you know, mimic as much as I can and apply it into my game. And, you know, they did the little things right. You know, they served their teammates. They, um, you know, they were a quiet leader. You know, they played at a high level, but they served their teammates. They served the community. They took care of the people in the building that they, you know, that they needed to so that when they got to Sundays, everything fell for them. And, and that's what I'm going to try to be. I'm going to try to be a leader like them and, and really focus on the importance of, you know, teamwork and, and serving and, and doing everything I possibly can. And when I did that, everything fell into place. And, uh, and, and now I'm here and, and, I, and I'm grateful for that. Well, Garrett, uh, appreciate your time today and really uh, happy about the success you've been having. And obviously glad you'll be here for the next four years. I appreciate it, my brother. Thank you so much. And my thanks to uh, Garrett Bowles for taking some time to chat there. I think everybody just feels pretty happy for this guy. I mean, it uh, took a lot of uh, uh, criticism the first three years of his career, really has been able to turn things around this season. And uh, the Broncos, uh, a nice job there rewarding one of their players that they drafted. They saw the potential in him. They've worked with him, developed him, and then now he's going to be here for the long term. Yeah, and credit to both sides, really, because Garrett put in the work said he evaluated things that did not work for him. Um, he stuck to it. He used his option being declined, his motivation. Um, he's found a way to provide for his family after, you know, really a difficult upbringing for him. It's something that was anything, you know, it, it, he did not have an easy one and uh, had a very difficult path to get to the NFL. So a credit to him for setting his children up for the future. And then I would say credit to the Broncos too, because that pick at the time, um, it was between Garrett Bowles and Ryan Ramchek. Bowles was the guy with all the potential. Ramchek was kind of the proven commodity. They went with Bowles and, you know, it didn't work for the first couple of years. I think Garrett would admit that. He did admit that on Monday. Um, but instead of trading him, instead of just getting rid of him, they kind of saw it through. And we've seen the dividends that being with Mike Munchak for a couple of years has done. Um, we've seen kind of the faith that Vic Fangio had in him be rewarded. And so I, I think that's just a good lesson for players in general is that, um, you know, guys might not pan out right away. The draft is kind of a crapshoot to some degree. You, you don't have a 100% or even a 75% hit rate, but you stick with some of these guys, uh, you can be surprised maybe by what they're able to develop into. So I think both sides here deserve some credit for, for sticking this one out. Definitely credit goes to both sides. I mean, uh, first we could talk about Bowles a little bit here. Nobody ever questioned his athletics ability. You know, I mean, he is uh, uh, moves really well and is really athletic. So 
I think the big question coming in was just about whether or not he was going to be able to pick up the game, whether or not he was going to be able to learn how to play. Uh, like you mentioned in the interview there, just not a ton of experience coming out of Utah, but the Broncos worked with him. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of credit goes to having some consistency there with Mike Munchak back to back years for the first time in his career, really able to uh, get the best out of uh, Garrett here this season. The interesting thing to me is when you ask him, hey, what's the one thing you've changed or what what's happened for you? He can't really pinpoint it. He just says nothing. I didn't really change anything. I'm just uh, understanding, you know, what I was doing wrong. Uh, sort of interesting there. You you think maybe you'd be able to be like, this is exactly what I'm doing now. That's different, but uh, not not really a case there with Garrett. But uh, as far as the Broncos go, here with five weeks to go in the se- in the regular season here, when you were looking at what was going to happen in the off season, Garrett Bowles and Justin Simmons were the big two priorities here. You know, and uh, I think now that you've gotten the Bulls. Uh, contract out of the way. Now you can focus completely on Justin Simmons and making sure that you're going to be able to bring back, you know, those two are arguably the best players on both sides of the ball. You know, Garrett has maybe been the best offensive player this year. And, and I think Simmons has been the best defensive player, arguably. Um, So having those two coming up was a big priority. Now that they're able to get Garrett done now, they can focus on Simmons moving forward. Yeah, I will say with Garrett in terms of his improvement, he just didn't play that much football, you know, before getting to the NFL. And so some of it might just be Phil that he clicked because he played enough. You know, he did show some signs of improvement toward the end of last year. Um, And so, you know, maybe it's just the fact that, hey, enough time in Mike Munchak's system, enough snaps overall. This was a guy that entered the NFL at age 25 or something like that. I mean, he just, you know, he didn't have the – traditional pop Warner football to high school to four years of college to the NFL. That was not his path. And so, um, you know, I think some of it is just realizing that he needed some time to, to develop and hone his technique and uh, get right on the mental side of it. Um, but yeah, you're right from a, an overall overarching view. Uh, the fact that they're able to get bowls done now frees up the franchise tag for Justin Simmons, which is not to say that, you know, they're going to use it or that he's going to play on the franchise tag again. But if you had to go into the off season needing to sign both those guys, one of them was very likely going to hit free agency and be able to demand, uh, you know, a salary from other teams, which either raises your price if you do keep them or you lose them. And so, you know, being able to now exclusively negotiate with Justin Simmons until July you know, if it takes that long, just a huge benefit in terms of getting things done and not having to worry about like, hey, we've got to get this done before March. Um, Because, you know, if you're Justin, in that case, why not see what, you know, he said he wants to stay here, but why not see what you can get on the market? And so obviously helps the Broncos as they try to, to keep two young players, Bulls a little bit less young, just given when he came into the league, but um, probably two still ascending players that you hope are can be part of this team turning things around at some point. And Eric, the name of the game in the NFL is draft well and keep those guys who turn out to be really good, keep them. So, you know, when you hit on a guy, you got to make sure you keep them. So that, that I think is the important thing here for the Broncos moving forward. Eric, the sun is getting out of control in my house here. You can even see me over here. You're blending right in. The light has shunned down on, on this podcast the same way that it's shunned down on uh, on Garrett Bowles. It's true. Shined? I think shined. I don't think shined. shun is correct. Shined. 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 I'm like half, half of me is in the picture here. Make sure you watch this one on YouTube. Really great video. It's nice. Yeah. Eric, should we get to uh, uh, some voicemails here? Let's do it. Hey, guys. Jeff Ladd again. Uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, I'm going to have to reschedule Victory Monday for, uh, looks like Monday, December 7th. I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. I'll keep you guys posted if there's any changes. Talk to you later. How do you feel about this? I think it's a good strategy. I like he's, it. He's rescheduling for next Monday. I don't know. I, I might need to, you might need to reschedule another 
another week or so. Let's give yourself some grace, a grace period. Yeah, let's let's hope not. Uh, here, let's get to our uh, second voicemail here. Well, Phil, you got your wish, man. Not only is Drew Locke benched, but the entire QB room is benched. So this is this is what you wanted all along, isn't it? You wanted to send a message. Well, I hope you're happy. The whole room is benched. I I I think I even heard that you were wearing a Kendall Hinton jersey out in the community this week, which is not only irresponsible for the morale of the city, but in in the midst of a pandemic, Phil. So, anyways, just uh, you did it, man. You did it. You got the whole whole room bench. You you taught them all a lesson. Well done. Uh, this is Harry from San Diego, and I'm just kidding. I respect the institution that is Phil Milani. You're doing a great job. Eric, you're doing a great job. Thankful for your show. Uh, and I also am very thankful for Broncos Batman doing the outro. I love that. It's been, uh, it's been wonderful. So thanks for that. Peace. Go Broncos. Eric, NZ Nation has been bringing the heat with these voicemails. And a lot to unpack there from Harry. I think he's, uh, Absolutely right. You were angling for Drew to get benched, so you got what you wanted. Um, How did he know I had that hidden jersey? Yeah, I don't know. Man, you're the, you're the only one. They had yeah. to come ask you for it back so that he could play. Exactly. Uh, I had picked that up earlier in the year, just having a feeling, you know, and a premonition, right. really a premonition. I'm not sure how I feel about you being called an institution. Yeah, he said that me wearing that jersey uh, was bad for morale of the city. Yeah, you're like not they, the voice of the city, though. That's not your no. job. I do not have a bar, Eric. I know that. Right. Yeah. But just me wearing that to like the grocery store or like on a walk at the park, people are going to see that and it's upsetting. It would have been upsetting. Right. That's true. I do appreciate, I love it when everybody picks up on our inside jokes and they understand that we're just kidding around. And that was funny about the benching of the quarterbacks. That was, that had me laughing. Were I you kidding it. around? Yes. You? Yeah. That was Got it. I must've missed that. That was a joke. I know that uh, uh, you don't really pick up on things well. You know, like right. a lot, I have to explain a lot to you after the show's over. You're like, right. as an institution, what just happened? And I, I'm like, Eric, like, it's okay. Like, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Can I say you belong in an institution? Is that appropriate <laughs> or no? No, that's not it. Got that's it. not appropriate. Okay. That's okay. it. I was just asking if I could say it. Yeah. You, know, you can say it. A lot of okay. fans are saying, uh, asking that question. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, Eric, let's get to another voicemail. What's up, Mitch Zone? It's Dave calling in again from Pittsburgh. Uh, first off, I wanted to apologize to Malik Reed for the mistake I made with his name last week. Uh, I was pretty fired up about the win. Uh, no excuse. Uh, that dude is a beast. Uh, and again, I'm sorry. Uh, there's one thing Mitch Zone has been missing for a while now, and that's a limerick. On a day in which no quarterback starred, a win was not in the cards. This was not a real game, and that is a shame but I'm glad our boys went out and played hard. Look, the NFL should be embarrassed by the quality that they allowed to be put on display today. Um, I went to Navy, and so I watched a lot of football games without a passing game, and uh, this was just awful compared to that. We didn't get any chance to insert this offense or practice or do anything, any opportunity to do any handoffs with these guys. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was just a joke. Um that being said, I would have loved to have seen Drew Locke queued up against that team. Our D was balling out early, you know, close game. Uh, I think they would have definitely given us a chance, you know, if the different circumstances. But that being said, look, everybody's everybody, no matter what, you know, we all have to mask up. Uh want to wish a big congrats to uh, Garrett Bowles on this new contract. I love seeing us retaining our talent. And, uh, and one last thing for Eric. I know you think nobody agrees with Phil, but, man, that guy's got some great takes. He's fun to listen to, and I love it. Also, he's not wishing he was covering the Steelers. Didn't really hear much denial on that Thanksgiving pod. <laughs> I'm just playing, guys. Uh, keep feeding us the good content, and uh, be well, and happy holidays, everybody. Cheers. Happy holidays uh, there in Pittsburgh, Dave. Hopefully uh, you are able to enjoy a nice Thanksgiving, and uh, you got the holiday season coming up. Uh, Dave, a big Phil fan. Yeah, and I like Dave, even despite that. 
Um, and listen, Dave, you went to Navy. You didn't watch a passing game. I went to Northwestern. I didn't see much of a passing game either. And they actually try to pass the ball. So that's a even a bigger bummer, I think. Anything but, uh, to get in some cat stock for you, huh? Exactly. <laughs> RIP. You don't see me talking about the buffs up here. We're three and zero, baby. Yeah. Who did you? You guys played like uh, Pueblo this weekend, didn't you? Uh, raise your hand if your college football team is still undefeated. <laughs> oh, it cuts deep. It yeah. cuts deep. It really does. Yeah. You you had already uh, bought tickets for the Big Ten championship, right? Yeah, next year I was just going to go retroactively. Even if they didn't make next year's, I was going to pretend like that was this year's. Yeah. This it will all be settled, though, in a couple of years. What, 2028, I think, when CU plays Northwestern? I think you know, I think you only have to wait till 2026. So, oh, good. Um, I think that that's your 56th birthday, maybe 55th. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll uh, be able to celebrate there. Yeah, you'll be able to drive over from Pittsburgh when you're covering the Steelers, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I don't know if I'll have my license yet. You know, you have to be <laughs> 16 to get your uh, full license. So in Pennsylvania. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, that was a that was a really good voicemail. Always appreciate Dave calling in. Malik Reed was very upset. He was like, "Hey, what's up with Dave?" And and then I explained to him. I said, "Hey, he didn't mean it." And uh, I'm sure that he'll feel like everything's rectified after uh, the apology this week. Uh, one more voicemail here, Eric, for you. Hey, fellas, this is Brandon from Iowa. Uh, game just got over a few moments ago. I thought that was. Going to be what we are going to see a lot of runs. I fully acknowledge the attempts to pass, and I think that that was pretty much what we were going to see. I know deep down I wanted some big bombs or some kind of uh, play or something. It's very tough to do that when you have 25 hours to prepare for a game. Um, shout out to offense for trying as much as they did. That defense carried this game. Thank God for them for playing as well as they did, limiting New Orleans. I know it looked like their game plan, New Orleans game plan, was to just run the ball a lot, you know, and maybe that was just the best bet for both teams to try and squeak this one out, even though we all know probably – shouldn't have been played, but you know what? Teach their own. It was still a fun game to watch from top to bottom as far as getting to watch these guys play again on a Sunday, and we'll hope for the absolute best going into Kansas City. Thanks, guys. Eric, the thing that I like about Brandon from Iowa is that his tone is the same, win or lose. He sounds exactly the same way. You can't get too high, can't get too low. Smart. Exactly. And it's part of his uh, Monday tradition to uh, call in and leave a voicemail. So we appreciate that. And uh, he was just happy to see some football. Yeah. No, yeah. It was, uh, I thought the first quarter was among the more exciting first quarters I've seen in a while, just because you expected it to get out of hand really quickly. And it didn't. Um, I do think it also shows, you know, a lot of the time fans are like, why don't you just throw it deep? It's hard to even just do that, you know. Kendall Hinton tried to do that a couple of times and it almost got picked off twice and then did get picked off two other times. It's not as simple as just like, Jerry, you run straight and uh, I'll throw it to you. See, that's how simple I think that it is. I know. It's not you. I mean, you in the old uh, fraternity lot, you're leading your uh, brothers to victory. It's not that simple, Phil. You were, I mean, I had some intram- star. intramural moments. Oh, I'm sure you did. The glory yeah, days. Actually, didn't they have to make like a height exception for you because everyone else complained that you were too tall? Yeah. Yeah. They said it's not fair. You know, he's got to play only varsity football. Right. You know, he the can't size play intramurals. Two normal humans. Exactly. I've I've got the height requirement down. I could yes. play. Yeah. If only coach would have put me back in in that state title game. You know, who knows what would have happened. Right. I mean, the crazy thing, though, is that you're 6'5", but only weigh 140 pounds. I mean, that's just it's wild. Yeah. yeah, it is wild. 
frail, I Physi think is the word. Physical specimen. Nobody's ever seen a body quite like this. You know, that's how I would, that's how I describe it. Yeah. I think that's but, fair. Eric, let's uh, get to one email here. We got a lot of voicemails these days, but just the one email. This one came from Bill. And uh, he writes and he says, I have a question. If the quarterback situation would have happened to the Saints rather than the Broncos, would this game have been played on Sunday? I think not. Once again, we see the league's prejudice against the Broncos. How many players were involved with the Tennessee-Pittsburgh outbreak? And Eric, we kind of touched about this a little bit earlier. I think he shares a sentiment a lot of fans do. Yeah, and again, I think if there was signs of an uncontrolled outbreak, maybe uh, that would have it would have been different. But I think the other thing, Phil, is that the Saints were already in the air by the time this happened. By the time it came out that Drew Locke and Brett Rippon and uh, Blake Bortles were ineligible, and so I think the question is, what would you like? What would the Saints have done had they landed and you said, well, the game's on Tuesday? You know, then they got to stay in, in this hotel for three days. Uh, they don't have their practice gear. They're not, you know, set up to continue to get ready for the game. So to me, that's where the issues come in. And, you know, it's hard to look at it in retrospect and say what would have happened if the news came out before they took off. But I think once they were in the air and on the way to Denver, uh, that, that kind of finalized it. Yeah. I don't think there's any... There's, nobody has anything against the Broncos. You know, that's not the case. You know, they just want to be able to get these games played in a sa as safe a possible manner as they can. And, uh, you know, to ensure that there wasn't spread, the, you know, the Broncos quarterback's going to play. You know, it just so happened that that's the most important position on the field. You know, I wonder, like Eric, it kind of makes me wonder, like, what position, if they removed it, would have been like it would have been a different game if like all offense alignment couldn't have played. Yeah. That would have been bad too. That would have been bad. Or if they're like, no wide receivers could play, you know, just then we kind of would have had the game that we had on Sunday. Right. Well, they could throw it just a lot more to like Noah Fant. Yeah. You know? I think quarterback is probably the biggest yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. All right, Eric, uh, any shout outs here on this Monday? Probably Liz Manis. Yeah, I think would be a good one. Of course. Uh, um, I should shout out Garrett Bowles. Nice yeah. to get that deal done. Uh, Justin Simmons leading the AFC safeties and Pro Bowl votes. It seems like he might finally get his uh, first Pro Bowl selection. And uh, voting for fans uh, on Twitter, I think, starts on t Tuesday tomorrow. I believe that's correct. Something like that. Yeah. So, hey, make sure you get these Broncos to the Pro Bowl this year. You know, maybe Bryce Callahan, he's got his injured foot, but, uh, you know, uh, he might miss some substantial time here, Fangio said, but heck, a, a Pro Bowl nomination would be nice, huh? And it's virtual, so he doesn't even need a foot. Yeah. He just he just needs an internet connection. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, hey, get Bryce Callahan, get Justin Simmons, Garrett Bowles. You know, these are the potential Pro Bowlers here for the Broncos, so. I think that's going to do it, Eric. You got anything else you want to say? No, I don't think so. Yeah, we better wrap this up because if you're watching, the sun is about to just completely consume me and I'm going to melt into a, a big puddle here. Your time has come. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us. Uh, thanks to Garrett Bowles for taking some time to chat about his new contract. Uh, we bro broke down what happened with the Broncos quarterback situation in the game against the Saints and what that means moving forward. Of course, we'll be back a little bit later in the week to talk about this Chiefs game. Until then, for Eric Dalala, I'm Phil Milani. You've been listening to The, the Neutral Zone. This is Bronco Batman, and you're listening to The Neutral Zone. <laughs>